Hello, church. We're so glad you've joined us today for our online worship service. Uh, this is kind of the new normal for right now. Uh, until we're able to safely meet together again in person, uh, we're going to be worshiping online like this. Uh, we realize it's a little different for you. They're worshiping in your home, and it's even a little bit different for us talking to a camera rather than a live congregation. Uh, but our prayer is that this is still a genuine worship experience for all of us, that we worship God in spirit and truth, praying to him sincerely, singing songs of praise to him, digging into his word together. So we're really glad you've joined us today. Uh, this is Palm Sunday, which means, um, as we traditionally do, we're going to talk about Jesus entering Jerusalem uh, the Sunday before he's crucified. And we're also going to take the Lord's Supper uh, as we remember how he was crucified on that Friday uh, for our sins and what that means for us. So taking the Lord's Supper at home like this will be a little bit different. But again, we pray it's a really meaningful and special time for all of us. As we begin this service, I do want to begin with scripture and prayer. But before I do, I want to just mention a couple of words of encouragement. One, I just want to let you know God is working. God is working right now through even these difficult and unusual circumstances. We see God drawing people to himself. Uh, we've seen people save. We've seen people come back to the Lord, people drawing near to him, and we're excited about that. We've also seen God working through our life groups. Uh, they're continuing to meet virtually online, some of them just through calls and texts. But we see God continuing to work through our life groups and disciples uh, being made, and, and we're real excited about what God's doing um, through our life groups. And then also God's working through individuals. We've heard testimonies of how God is working in individuals in our church, uh, meeting needs of the people around them, having gospel conversations. So just be encouraged that times are difficult and different, uh, but God is working. And then also just want to encourage you as God is working uh, to let God work in you and through you. Most of us have probably have a little bit more time at home right now than we normally do. I just want to encourage you to make use of that. Let's not just all spend all of our time watching Netflix and, and being on Facebook and Instagram and all those kind of things. But let's make it a priority to be uh, digging into God's word, spending time with him in prayer and drawing close to him. Let's let um, this be an opportunity for us to grow in our relationship with God. And then also let's look for ways to minister to those around us. Look for needs, look for opportunities to share the gospel and point people to Jesus. I really believe God's going to give us Lots of great opportunities to do those things. They may not always be in person, but hopefully we can do those things even if they're uh, through online platforms or uh, texts and calls and those kind of things. So just want to encourage you, God is working. Uh, let him work in you. Let him work through you. And let's be the church God has called us to be. Let's continue to pray. Let's continue to trust him. Let's continue to worship. Uh, let's continue to serve and to witness. And, and if, you're po if it's possible, let's continue to give. We know in these circumstances, maybe not everybody is, is as able to give as they were before. All these things changed, uh, but it's still important for us to be the church, to continue to worship through giving. Uh, there'll be ways on the screen that show you how you can give through text, through going through our website, through the mail, or even through dropping off your tithes and offerings in person. But we just want to encourage you, if you're able, to continue to give and, and let that be an act of worship. I want to go ahead and begin us now with a uh, an opening prayer, and then read some scripture, and then we'll go into song. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And let me encourage you, uh, don't just listen to my prayer, but please join me in praying. Lord, these are unique and difficult times for many, but we know you are working your will for our good and your glory. God, we pray that your will is done. We pray for healing for the sick, we pray you will provide for the physical and financial needs that many have. We continue to pray for medical and government leaders that you give them wisdom. Lord, we pray that you will continue to draw people to you as we've seen that you're already doing. But we pray that the lost will be saved, that those who don't know you would trust in Jesus for salvation. God, we pray that the prodigals would return home. Lord, those that have maybe strayed from you, would turn and come back to you and draw close to you and follow you wholeheartedly. And Lord, for those that were maybe already walking with you before all this happened, before all these changes came about in our lives, Lord, I pray that they would continue to be strengthened and continue to grow spiritually and be used by you for your purposes. Lord, may we be the church you call us to be. Even as we're dispersed and can't meet together, Lord, may we still be your body, be your hands and feet out there accomplishing your mission. Lord, today as we remember 
Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. May we remember that he is the Messiah, the one who came to save us. And Lord, as we remember his death on the cross on Good Friday, may we remember the sacrifice he made for us. May we all make sure that we have trusted in Jesus alone for our salvation. Through his, uh, trusted in his sacrificial death on the cross for our sins. And may we worship and praise you as the God who saves. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to read to you just a short passage from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, that describe Jesus the Sunday before his crucifixion entering Jerusalem. It says, When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, <laughs> Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place so that, this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, then they laid their clothes on them, and he said on them, a very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now let's praise Jesus through song using the same words, some of the same phrases that they used 2,000 years ago as he entered into Jerusalem. Thank you. 
At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. What a great song just to get your heart ready to focus on the cross this morning. Today is a special day as we celebrate Palm Sunday. I'm so glad Jeff at the beginning of this service read in the scripture about when Jesus came into Jerusalem on that Sunday riding on a donkey, people waving palm branches, and singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, you fast forward up to Thursday, Jesus gathers his disciples with him there in the upper room in Jerusalem. And there in that upper room, he washes their feet, and then he shares the Passover meal with them. And there in that Passover meal, he would take a piece of bread and would tell them that this bread represents his body, that was broken for them. He would take a cup and also explain to them that that cup would symbolize his blood that was shed for them. Well, we're going to be participating in the Lord's Supper this morning. Such a great, meaningful time to focus on what Jesus has done for us. Now, parents, let me just tell you, this is a great opportunity for you to talk to your kids about what the Lord's Supper means. Let them listen to what we are going to talk about in the scriptures and then maybe hit the pause button and, and just ask questions, making sure that they understand. It's going to be a great morning. If you uh, don't have the things ready for the Lord's Supper, you might just want to hit pause because in a few minutes we'll participate together. Uh, you just need some bread or crackers, uh, a cup for everyone that's participating with you and something to drink and, and uh, just get that together. Have that ready. Again, you can push, push pause and come back and join us. But uh, again, this is going to be a, a tremendous worship time as we look at the cross and what Jesus did for us. So let me pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into our scriptures this morning. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for what you did for us over 2,000 years ago. Thank you for this morning that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Even though we're not in the same room but Lord, we can look at scriptures, understand what you said and instructed your disciples to do. And then Lord, we can share in it to remember what you did for us. So Lord, we ask you to speak to our hearts. Thank you for the worship that we've experienced thus far. Take your word, let it accomplish in our life what you want it to accomplish. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, I want you to open it to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, we'll start there in uh, verse 7. So you've got Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, third book in the New Testament. So let's start and read it together. It says, Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Now, let me go back to verse 1 there in chapter 22 to kind of help you to understand some of the words here. It says in verse 1, The festival of unleavened bread, which is also called Passover, was approaching. Now, you see those two, two uh, terms there, Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. Well, you got to go back to Exodus to find out about the Passover. The Jews were instructed to have a meal that would help them to remember what God did in delivering them out of Egypt. That was a one-day-a-year event called the Passover, where they would partake in this meal together. And then the day after the Passover, they would have a festival or a feast called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and it would go on for another eight days. So you see them interchanging in the scriptures. So in verse 8, it says, Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. 
Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. And he replied, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said as they had prepared the Passover meal there. Now, let me stop there for a minute. Why did Jesus go to all this detail in telling the disciples where they were going to meet? I mean, it looks like he could have just went out and said quickly, hey, this is where I want you to go. Well, you got to understand something. This was a pretty important meeting that Jesus would have with his disciples. He wanted to meet with them there in that upper room in Jerusalem. He wanted to partake of the Passover with them. He wanted to prepare them for what was going to happen the next day. All of this was in accordance with what God had planned in Jesus' life. And here's why he did what he did and said what he did. If you go back to verse 3, or really verse 2, it says, The leading priests and teachers of religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Then Satan entered into Judas, Iscari Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve disciples, and he went to the leading priest and captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted, and they promised to give him money. Listen to verse 6. So he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. You see, if Judas would have known exactly where Jesus was meeting his disciples in Jerusalem, he would have probably had those, those religious leaders go to that upper room and arrest Jesus there. But Jesus had a plan. He knew that things needed to happen according to how God had laid them out. In other words, God was in control, not Judas, not those religious leaders. Now, let me just say this. We're in living in a day and time where we have to depend on God being in control. It looks like at times our world is out of control, but friend, you can trust God that he is in control. He was in control of Jesus's trial, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, all in accordance with God's plan. God has a plan for your life. He's in control. Well, let's continue to, to read. Verse 14, it says, When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again, until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, again, what is the meaning of the Passover? Well, the Passover, again, if you go back into the book of Exodus, you find where, where the children of Israel had been delivered out of Egypt. And on their way out of Egypt, God instructed Moses to have this meal with lots of different things involved in it, that it would be a way for them to remember what God had done in delivering them out of Egypt. Remember his faithfulness. Remember his power. But also the Passover would be to the Jews, a way for them to look ahead, knowing that the things that they were doing in that Passover meal would also symbolize the coming of the Messiah. That Passover lamb would be fulfilled when Jesus, our Passover lamb, would come. And so what Jesus is saying here, I tell you, now, I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. In other words, he was telling his disciples, this is the last Passover that there'll be. After this, there'll no longer need to be a, a Passover meal because remembering now will be remembering what Jesus did on the cross. The bread and the cup would be the emphasis and the elements used in remembering what Jesus did. So, the Lord's Supper for us, Jesus says, do it in remembrance of him. It looks back, but it also looks forward to his return. Now, notice what Jesus says here when he tells his disciples how all this is going to change. Starting in verse 17, he says, Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And then he said, take this 
and share it among yourselves. Well, now at the Passover meal, there were four cups that the Jews used in that meal. And the first cup was a cup of thanksgiving. That's the cup that Jesus was referring to here in verse 17. Take this cup, this first cup, give thanks and share it with each other. And then in verse 18, he says, For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. In other words, he's repeating again how this Passover is the last time that he will eat with them, but also the last time they will eat the Passover because now they're going to be instructed on how to take the bread and take the cup and remember his death on the cross. So look at verse 19. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, the bread was a part of the meal. And so when Jesus took that bread at the meal, he just literally broke it. And normally what they would do is just take and eat it. It had a symbolic meaning in the Passover. But Jesus would now say, this bread will symbolize my body that will be broken for you. And then in verse 20, he says, after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, now this another cup of wine is the third cup. This was the cup that was drank after the meal. And so after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Now, that third cup in the Passover was a cup that would symbolize the blood that was taken and put on the doorposts there in Egypt as the children of Israel were instructed to take that lamb, slaughter that lamb, take the blood, put it on the doorpost, and the death, death angel would pass over. That cup was pretty important. It symbolized that life that God had granted to the children of Israel. And so when Jesus took that cup, that third cup, and held it up. He says, now this cup that symbolized the blood on the doorpost in Egypt now will symbolize my blood that would be shed and sacrificed for you. Now, go back and look at verse 15. Jesus said, I I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. Now, you can just imagine the disciples were sitting there they were eating this Passover meal with Jesus, and he's talking about his death. He's talking about his body that will be broken for them, his blood that was shed for them. He told them, I've been looking forward to eating this meal with you before my suffering begins, which would be the very next day. Now, I, I can just imagine how those disciples were perplexed. I mean, Jesus had spoken about his death all through his life, his three years with him. I mean, he had told them time and time again that, that he was going to suffer and he was going to he was going to die. They didn't understand it. I don't think they probably understood it here. I mean, here was Jesus, the one who had said that he was God. He was the Son of God. They had seen miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, he walked on water. He calmed a storm. He healed hundreds of people. He even raised Lazarus from the dead. And here he's telling his disciples that he's going to be crucified, he's going to suffer and die on a cross? Well, let me just tell you, when you think about when Peter confronted Jesus, the Bible says one day that, that Jesus was telling his disciples again that he was going to die. And the Bible says that Peter, which was one of the ones that loved Jesus more than others, John loved him the most, but Peter loved Jesus too. But the Bible says that Peter got so upset that he confronted Jesus. In fact, the Bible says he pulled Jesus away and rebuked him, got in his face. And listen to what Jesus said. The Bible says he looked at Peter and said, Satan, get thee behind me. Now, he knew Peter was doing what he was doing and saying what he was saying out of love. And he wasn't calling Peter Satan. But what he was doing was acknowledging something that is so important for us and looking at this this morning, Satan doesn't want us to focus on the cross. 
Satan knows that Jesus' death on the cross would be the way that you and I would have a relationship with God. In fact, Jesus himself said there is no way to get to the Father except through the Son. And the only way to know Jesus is to know him through the cross of Christ. Now, just in a minute, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're going we're gonna to take a, a piece of bread and you're going to take a cup and, and we're going to remember what Jesus did on the cross. But before we do, I, I want to highlight what the Bible has to say about how a person can have a relationship with God through the cross of Jesus. Now, let me just tell you, parents, if you've got kids, this is an important time for them to, to listen and to hear what the Bible has to say about how to become a Christian. Any time through this, if you want to hit pause and just ask questions or, or let them respond to what they're hearing or explain it even some more for them, please take that opportunity. If you're a new Christian and, and maybe you hadn't been a Christian very long at all, this is going to be important for you to be reminded about what the gospel means what it says, what the Bible says about how to have a relationship with God. And if you're not a Christian, you're watching or listening to us this morning, you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I'm sure the Lord's Supper maybe is kind of odd and strange to you. Maybe you don't know what it means, but the most important thing is about what you're to hear, and that is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say about how a person can know God? Well, Again, it starts with a verse in the Bible that simply says, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Matthew 3.20, excuse me, Romans 3.23 says that all of us are sinners, every one of us. There's not a person watching or listening this morning that is outside of that category. We all, the Bible says, are sinners. So when you come to the cross, you come admitting that you're a sinner. But the Bible says the wages of our sin is death. In Romans 6, 23, it says clearly that what we deserve for the sins that we've committed is punishment. And so when you come to the cross of Christ, what you see is punishment. You see death. But it's not the sin that Jesus committed. It's our sins. The Bible goes on to say that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. How is that? Well, again, when you come to the cross, the Bible says that it's a way that God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners. Now that tells us that we didn't do anything at all that deserved us getting the salvation that we have from Jesus. He didn't die on the cross because because we deserved him to die. He died willingly. He died as a demonstration of his love for us. And that's why when you come to 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, for he, that is God, made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, for he made him who knew no sin to become sin in our behalf. That means when you look at the cross, Jesus didn't die for his sin. He died for ours. It's almost like there was an exchange. Jesus took our sins upon himself on the cross and gave us his righteousness in replace. It was an exchange. The Bible says, he who, who, he who, <laughs> let me get the verse right. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our, on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God through him. What a great verse that just shows the picture of our salvation. He made him, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin. Jesus never committed a sin. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf. That means when Jesus was on the cross, he was as if he was being punished for every sin that we committed. We deserve that punishment. And friend, here's the good news. He took our place, and he did it willingly, freely. He did it as a demonstration of his love to us. So, what do we do when we're at the cross? Well, the Bible is clear. The first thing in coming to, 
to the cross and admitting that we're a sinner, we repent. That was the, the message that Jesus came proclaiming. John the Baptist, before Jesus, proclaimed that very same message. Repent. Repent. Now, what does repentance mean? Well, again, when you come to the cross, it means that you are admitting that you're a sinner, that you've been obeying not the laws of God, but obeying yourself, letting yourself be God. And now repentance is turning from that sin and trusting Jesus that what he did on the cross, he did for you. Repentance is a great picture of how we come to Jesus. We come turning from our sin and turning to a holy God and trusting him that what he did on the cross would save us. And the Bible says that we invite him to take over our life. We give him our life. In other words, what Jesus did in dying on the cross really is a picture of what we're to do when we come to Christ. We're to die to ourself. We're to give him our life. We're no longer in control. We're now following Jesus and what he says in his word. That's why the cross is so special. And that's why when we come to the Lord's Supper, it's so important for us to, to understand how incredible that cross is and what Jesus did on it for us. In just a minute, when you take that, that piece of bread or cracker and you take that cup and you eat that bread and you drink of that cup, you remember what Jesus did for you on the cross. Now, let me just say this. Again, parents, if you're there with your family and you've got kids, this will be a great opportunity just to hit pause and talk about what we've just talked about here, what it means to be a Christian, helping to make sure they understand that, listening to their, their testimony. Maybe they've got questions that, that you can spend some time answering for them or, or just seeking, seeking ways that you can help them. If you're not a Christian, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can ask him to come into your heart right now. What we're about to do is for believers, is for people that know the cross and how special the cross is, to know that Jesus died on that cross for me and I can take that bread and, and that cup and celebrate and remember what he's done for me. <clears throat> but if you're not a Christian, you can invite him to come into your life right now. Now you say, well, I've got questions or I need some help. Well, at the bottom of your screen, there is a text that I want to encourage you just to take a moment and send us a text. Let us know how we can help you. Let us know how we can pray for you. I can assure you that someone will respond to that text and help you in your questions and in your journey of following Christ. Well, I'm going to pray and then we're going to join together and uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. So let me, uh, let me pray right now. God, thank you so much for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that the Bible is clear on how we can have a relationship with you. And thank you on a day that we are celebrating the Lord's Supper. We can have full understanding and meaning of what you did for us. And Lord, we can obey what you have told us to do this, to remember you. So, Lord, bless this next segment as we partake of the Lord's Supper together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, again, if you don't have your bread and your cup and your things ready, you might just pause and then just rejoin us. I know this is a little awkward. I've never taken the Lord's Supper like this. Maybe you've never taken it in this setting either. But I really believe that this is going to be a meaningful time for you to just worship the Lord through what he has instructed in that piece of bread or cracker that symbolizes his body and that cup that will symbolize his blood that was shed for us. I want to draw attention to a, a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You don't have to turn there because you're going to need your hands free, but just let me read it. Paul was given the instruction from the Lord on the Lord's Supper for the early churches. Uh, what we read in the book of Luke was God's account of what Jesus did with his disciples. But the Bible says that Paul was given some specific instructions that would help the church to know how to observe this supper that Jesus had with his disciples. So listen to what he says. Chapter 11, starting in verse 23. 
He says, this is Paul speaking, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. And on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you've got a piece of bread or a cracker, make sure everybody's got one in your group or if you're taking this by yourself, I'm going to take a, just a piece of bread. And the Bible says when Jesus held up that bread on that night with his disciples, he just simply said, this would symbolize my body that would be given in sacrifice for you. And he told them to take and eat it. Would you do that with me right now? Listen to verse 25. It says, In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. So you take your cup, whatever that cup might be, and as you hold it, again, let me remind you, that Jesus, when he held up that third cup that would symbolize the blood in that Passover celebration, that he would now draw attention that that cup would symbolize his blood that would be shed for them. The Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. So as we drink of this cup together, let's remember what Jesus did in dying on the cross so that you and I could have forgiveness of our sins. Would you take and drink it with me? Well, I want to thank you for being a part of this. I hope that it has been a meaningful worship time wherever you are and whatever um, situation you're in with your family or with just a couple or whoever, uh, we're so glad that you joined us to be a part of this celebration. Now, let me remind you that next Sunday is Easter. Uh, and I have to be honest with you, I'm 61 years old. I have never had an Easter that I wasn't at church. Maybe some of you have that same story that every year at Easter, you've always been at church somewhere worshiping the Lord. Well, this year's different. We're not going to be able to come together. Excuse me. Finish my bread. We're not going to be able to come together and worship on Easter Sunday. But listen to me. I really believe that this could be the most incredible Easter celebration that we could ever experience. Because you know what? There's going to be people that I believe that are going to watch or listen that maybe had other plans on Easter, maybe maybe we're out doing other things, and, and maybe this year at Easter, this is gonna be a way for many, many people to use that Sunday to just listen or watch and hear the gospel, maybe for some of them for the first time. So here's what I want you to do. First of all, I want you to pray. I believe that this could be a great week of us preparing our own hearts to worshiping together. Yes, it's going to be different. It, it won't be in a church or what we've been used to at the Performing Arts Center in Greenwood. It, it might be whatever setting you're going to be in, but the Lord is there. He says wherever two or more gather, he's there in the midst. And if he is in your heart, wherever you are, you can worship him. And so I want you to pray this week that God would prepare our hearts and get us ready for worship next Sunday. Now, also, not only do you pray, I want you to ask the Lord to give you opportunities this week to minister and to, to reach out to people. There's all kinds of ways of, of telling people about uh, this service and how they, can, how they can connect, whether it's through radio or online, YouTube, Facebook, uh, lots of ways that we hope that, that you'll use to help people connect. There'll be people all over that will be connecting. And so we just need to be praying as the body of Christ 
that God would use us this week. Gospel conversations that Jeff mentioned and a lot of the things that he mentioned at the beginning of the service are things that we're hearing every single day that's going on here. So I believe that this could be a wonderful week of getting our hearts ready and getting ready for what God is going to do. I believe a revival has already begun. I'm hearing it, seeing it, and praying for it. And I pray that uh, that's what's on your heart, that you're looking for God doing some amazing things. So this is an important week, so uh, get ready. Now, last week, if you watched or listened to our service, we closed our service. And I said, I, I just want us uh, to close with one of my favorite songs. And then my mind went blank. I couldn't, I couldn't remember what the favorite song was. So we're going to do the same thing, but it's just going to be a different one of my favorite songs. I wrote it down in big, bold letters to make sure I didn't forget. It's the great hymn, Tis So Sweet, to Trust in Jesus. Now, let me just tell you, Brother Tom does an amazing job of just singing this song from his heart. And so the words are going to be at the bottom. You sing with him. I don't know of a greater way to end this service after we've taken the Lord's Supper than singing, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. So let's sing along with Tom. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon his promise just to know the safe the lord jesus jesus how i trust him how i prove him o'er and o'er jesus jesus precious jesus oh for 